I think we can squeeze in five or ten minutes of questions. Yep. Um, and again, I think we'll prioritize any questions from the floor. So maybe I'll, I'll hang on to that mic. I can run out to people. Um, and there are, yeah, maybe we'll start at the back. You can go next. That's your mic. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Sorry about that. <laughs> Thinking ahead. Yeah. All right. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, please go ahead. Hello, everybody. Great session. Thank you, panelists. There's been a question I've been trying to um, ask, and I wanted to listen to everybody before I ask that question. My question is, how can we truly achieve a balance between media democracy and press freedom and government censorship, taking into consideration two regimes? The first regime being the regime with so much freedom of press that a genuine security alert or government policy can easily be turned into comics, or partisan politics or propaganda, and the regime where the government can use censorship to combat human rights. I'm asking this question because, I mean, where I'm coming from, there's so much freedom of press that at some point in time, we begin to take for jokes genuine government policies, whereas I have friends in strict regimes with greater government censorship. How do we achieve the journalist who is a true watchdog and not a false inciter? Is it always that? Journalists are the victims, or sometimes genuinely, the government can be a victim. Thank you. Hmm. Yeah, fascinating. Who would like to feel I'm, that? I'm going to pass this mic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not okay. oh, wow. Well, yeah, good question. Maybe you should, should answer that. I think it goes into the question regarding who owns the infrastructure for media and, and journalism. Case in point, Twitter, who is a really important part of quite a lot of people's life. It's privately owned. There is no state, uh, state that, that can manage the platform. Should it, be, should it be that way? Should there be platforms that are not run by for-profit organizations? And if they're run by states, how do we make sure that the states doesn't use them for their own nefarious agendas that some regimes will do. I don't think there is a, there's not an answer to that question. You just need to see all the issues. Someone else want to have at it? I, I, I like, I'd like to know where she comes from, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Hmm. All right. Because yeah. usually you complain about lack of freedom of expression. Not, not, not the other way around. Just, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's an interesting point of view. I, I'm not yeah. mocking it. I'm just asking uh, genuinely because it's, uh, it's something I, I never heard before. So thank you for that. Mm. Would you like to go ahead? Uh, yeah. mm. So I think um, Elon Musk tweeted something the other day about um, how him buying Twitter was actually going to democratize the press because everyone on Twitter can become a journalist and share their views. And it made me very angry because where all not journalists, um, people obviously here are, um, just because you share a view on Twitter doesn't make you a journalist. So it goes back to if you've got loads and loads of people sharing information or creating news, creating content, it goes kind of back to the user to check their source and check the coverage and investigate that source. So if you see someone sharing some information, you look into them and you check whether they're a reliable news source. And then that's how you choose where you get your information from. Um, so there can be loads of people sharing information, but it's all about having the skills to investigate them and check whether they're reliable or not, um, as well as regulation. So there are kind of trusted, reliable news organizations. Um, yeah, it's about if you were to investigate someone and they were just like a random person who created a comic, you might question that and you might not use it as kind of the basis for any actual information. Um, that would be what I would say. Check your source. I'm going to uh, just... Uh, pose a follow-up because there's a there's a question in Slido that's very relevant to this and this this is probably for you Sorsha or or Caitlin stop to think is present in nearly every media literacy work that I've seen is there any evidence that telling people makes them do that and that it works oh good question um, good. <laughs> I don't think we have the evidence I don't know how you'd um, kind of check that we we ask children um, 
baseline and endpoint surveys questions when they do Newswise. Um, and at the end, we ask them, like, what's one thing that you take away from Newswise or what do you remember? And something that's, this is anecdotal, this isn't hard evidence. Something that's really common is the stop question check decide. Um, they repeat that at the end of the project. After they've been doing it for like five weeks, that's still what they remember right from the beginning. Um, so anecdotally, it goes in with our age group, especially because we get them to do their little routine, we get them to do actions. Um, I use it with my friends even, like in WhatsApp groups when they're sharing kind of like tweets and information that's going around. I'll be like, guys, I hate to be the ball, but can we all just stop? Um, so yeah, I think in answer to the question, long-term evidence, I don't know if that exists. I don't know if that research has ever been done. Anecdotally for us with the kids that we work with, it does work and it does go in. And teachers report that they see it throughout the academic year. So if they were to do it at the beginning of the academic year, they see them being more critical even at the end of the academic year. Or if they know them, if they see them again the following academic year, they still see them using those skills. So I've got a lot of anecdotal evidence, but I don't have the hard research. Um, yeah, so it's a really interesting question because it's something that we always want to strive for because the thing is when um, I'm dealing, I've talked to teenagers about the internet, like it, there's a fine line between like when their eyes start to roll like, oh God, what are you going to tell me? Oh yes, I know, I shouldn't do that. But one thing we, we came across as well when um, we, we also did a, a specialised project with um, young people from uh, special education schools and they just want, I just want to be on the internet like I just want to have fun I just want to watch videos I just want <laughs> I just want to not have to worry about it so it's the fine line between we want to obviously make them wary that there are harms and there's people who, who will may be predatory and may share stuff that is fake but at the same time we want we want to encourage them opening up their networks and, and getting support when they need to and things like that. So the one thing I would say is if we, all, like I said, if we had the answers, like my charity and uh, Newswise maybe would not exist. <laughs> like if young people were, or, or not just young people, it, we're hoping they grow up to be, you know, uh, fact checkers and they grow up to be uh, diligent with uh, media literacy skills and critical thinking skills. Um, but yeah, if, if we no longer have to exist and, and that they have the skills and they just automatically think, oh, wait, why, why am I seeing this? Oh, oh, there's this thing called an algorithm. Or, oh, yeah, the, the, this turned up because this person shared this or I mentioned this, etc. Just the awareness and the critical thinking about it, I think, can be very empowering for these young people because even though it is very disempowering because they have no control over that, at least they have control over whether they take that information in and whether they can actually, they actually uh, either share that information further or whether they actually and it sounds weird as well me telling you what young people are going to do because <laughs> i spend most of the workshops them telling me so i'm not going to admit that i'm an expert uh, on teenagers just i know how to i guess find answers for them hopefully hmm. we have a question in the front and yep. uh, while we're doing that anyone else who wants the mic please raise your hand this, this will probably uh, this is probably a rhetorical question but it might make uh, an interesting uh, uh, can give us some interesting thoughts for the manifesto because um, from my experience in the past when I used to, to teach young media students, I used to carry out an experiment showing them in little groups the same news story from television and you would see that they will interpret it all differently. So, so there isn't one message. So how can we ensure uh, when we're talking about media literacy that the message that is being delivered is being received in the same way? Okay, so, so I think that's a it's a bit of a rhetorical question, but we need to, to, to think about it. Um, we sp uh, Lourdes spoke about the collapse in news media and collapse in trust in, in institutions. And probably this is because we also have a collapse in, in, in politicians of a certain stature that people look up to and, and, and are willing to follow. But today, uh, are people still willing to follow leaders or people do, do people want to do their own thing because of the new wave of, of, of libertarianism where everybody wants to do his own thing and, and you know, let me be and, and, and I'll do my thing. So, so, so that's something which is also um, relevant to discussion of, of, of media literacy because the messages we are getting, um, social media has, has inundated, flooded us with, with these messages um, which are very often conflicted. Um, uh, and, and there was a point about young people in the news uh, that they see, young people see news on social media but they distrust it. Um, do they really distrust it or do they say they distrust it? 
because this is another thing which, which another rhetorical question because I mean, I, I have a lot of doubts about the surveys, the polls, that, that the results of polls that, 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 uh, that we find. I mean, yes. so, I mean, you carry out interviews, you carry out polls, and, and you, know, you, you get uh, so, so many diverse uh, results. Uh, so the, 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 the foundation is brilliant, yours too. Um, and I, I'd like to, to, to get to know a bit more about them you know, privately. We don't have to speak about this here. Thank you. Um, I would just say about the thing about them not trusting news that they see on social media. Um, there's kind of this <coughs> phenomenon that they outright distrust everything because they know that fake news is something that's really prevalent on social media, so they don't trust it, which then means that they don't trust any news that they see. They don't trust the papers, they don't trust TV news. So they, do, they know that what they're seeing on social media is questionable, and then that means, that means that they don't trust any news at all. That's what we find. So we want them to become critical, so we don't want them to just outright distrust everything. It's engaging with it and asking questions of it and deciding what you can and can't trust and knowing that there's that mixture out there. Um, that's what I would say in response to, do they not trust it? Because they really don't. And just before you pass the mic, do, do young people make, in, in your work, make the distinction between the media and the government, for example? Like this point about you know, not trusting the government and libertarianism and so on. Is it just all seen as one big blanket? Like, I don't trust any, <laughs> I don't trust any institution. Um, I'm gonna sort of partly answer mm -hmm. that, if that, makes, if that helps. Um, mainly because uh, one thing that I also dis uh, discuss with the young people is about like public service broadcasters. And one of the thing I'm, I mainly ask them is obviously I'm coming from the UK, I say, what makes the BBC so special? Like why, why is the BBC, like what is it? And a lot of them are just like, oh, it's owned by the government. Yeah, the government decides everything. And I, <laughs> it's the shock on their faces when they're like, wait, it doesn't? And I was like, it does have some control. It does have, uh, obviously, some of the finances and things like that. But I said, do you think uh, people like Rishi Sunak, who's uh, now prime minister, uh, do you think he would go on Newsnight and be questioned so rigorously like he does if it was owned by the government? Um, so all I can say is we try and make that distinction. Uh, but it, in my eyes, I'd much rather they'd be critical of everything, like everyone that's holding power. So the one who has the microphone, maybe like me, mm. <laughs> but also on top of that, the you know people in parliament. And we also, and I forgot to mention, we have an all party parliamentary group uh, in Westminster. So we, we also have the young people came to parliament and uh, they actually spoke to politicians about media literacy training that they've experienced. We actually had someone from Newswise come on, and we also had someone from the, e the Economist uh, Education Foundation that spoke to parliamentarians about their experience of both being on social media and also online. So, we, so I, I can't answer the question of trust because it's not something we measure, and I think it's kind of impossible to measure, but I can stress that we try. <laughs> we try really hard to distinguish the difference and also uh, give them the skills to uh, to critique, but in a constructive way, I hope. Lord, what's your analysis of this? And yes. Yeah. yes, definitely yeah. one of the reasons yeah. why um, a couple of my slides were mm -hmm. on the problematic of uh, defining and measuring media trust was uh, for the reason that uh, it's very difficult uh, and uh, especially because most of the research is done through polling. Um, what people say and what people do is are very often uh, different things and so everything i mean again uh, these things are scientific and on a general on a very big scale but everything has to be taken also uh, with a pinch of salt there i uh, do not people just say they don't uh, they don't believe uh, or they don't trust social media. But um, what I can say is that many different research has seen uh, social media at the very bottom of the trust ratings. That, but, but what I also say that is that uh, uh, news consumption and new use, use does not mean that you trust something. And with young people, this has become even more clear, it seems. Yeah, they're on it all the time. So the question is, does trust matter? Does it, does it matter? Right, right. Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah. yeah. 
I think, but perhaps we're looking at it from, I don't know, say, people my age or your age, how we use it and how they use it can be very differently. Um, I, you know, like, we have our acquaintances and our sort of friends, you know, like, uh, um, maybe they use it like we speak to strangers on the street, but it doesn't mean, you know, that there's trust there. I don't know, this is my mm -hmm. thought. Um, that is, because I wanted to just ask, sorry, Char, um, is your program available to teachers um, in other countries? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Yes, um, so the resources are available online for absolutely anybody in the world to download and use. They're completely free. We do teacher training. Um, we do a series once a term. They're completely free and accessible for everyone to join. We've had people from Singapore join, like all over the world. Um, the full package where you get a workshop, an opportunity to meet a journalist, and like teacher training, all that kind of stuff, that's for schools in the UK that um, have high levels of deprivation. Um, but for everything else, you are more than welcome to access it and use it. And if you want to invite us to Malta, to do Newswise in Malta, welcome. <laughs> Basic. <laughs> My God. Yeah. With a question here. Um, yeah. Yes, please. <laughs> um, just jumping to what was happening here, kind of a brainstorming, but um, we take media for granted in general. It wasn't here since forever. It's one of those things that we take like globalization, um, democracy. Can we, can we be living in a, like a post-media society, a post-trust society? society um just where it's one of those things i think one of those, those things that stuck the most with me was the thing about mars the little kid being like oh this has nothing to do with me of my life if you ask a kid from the 60s a kid that was living that life of the cold war mars was their problem you know the the whole space um conquest and everything everything was very big they were worrying about big things and now it seems like the younger generation are worrying more about their own problems which are a lot actually and it's just okay whatever the media says is something that is not happening in my household so why care I think it's a good point and that's also why we get them to write reports about stories that are happening around them um, it's getting them to tell us what they think is important because no one's asking 10 year olds what's important to them right now um, as so a newswise is an opportunity for them to do that and they pick a story and they tell us about it and yeah it's really important but I think yeah it's a good point there's also the question about what's not being reported, right? And we don't know what we don't know. Like what news matters and we can, we can choose it's and we can compare. But if we don't know what's not there, you know, that's a, that's a bigger question. Caitlin. Um, yeah, so what I, I want to raise is that that's an extremely good point, um, mainly because uh, we're, we're in a situation where like we have these young people and we want to empower them and we want to say, hey, look, you've got a voice, can't say what you want, but then, they'll, then they, they go, okay, but do I do that on social media? But then who's mm -hmm. going to look at that? And like, can I trust the people who are going to look at that? And are they going to listen to me? And is it going to really make sense and stuff like that? And that's why, like I said, we want them to be critical, but we want to stay still use these platforms if they can, but then do we trust the people who own TikTok to use that? It's just a whole plethora of um, problems. And that's what I meant by earlier, where like you can say to them, hey, you have a platform, but then they don't have control over it afterwards. And I think that maybe if we did go to the post press um, situation, I'm saying this as a journalist, so maybe I'm being a bit more like, um, I, I would say gatekeepery, but it sounds bad by saying it like that. But for, for me, it's still a, f a facilitator to be able to still control where the message goes. So if you if you send a story, so we work with local publications, we also work with national publications, and we send the stories to them, and we know that it will go that way, like it will go to the paper. But if and with social media, it's a question mark, isn't it? But it isn't a question mark that we want to stop people from questioning and stop people from approaching. I think I've sort of answered. Maybe I've gone on a bit of a tangent, but I hope that sort of make, makes sense. The answer is all of these are great questions, and I wish I knew the answer, but I guess the whole point of critical thinking when um, I come across it in our workshops is just thinking about what do we know, how do we know it, and stuff. But maybe yeah, this is a good concept to end on. I think we'll move, move from there, and we'll give you the last word here, Ollie. Yeah, I, yeah. I, think, I think we need to work in the other direction as well mm. with ac accountability. Where does the information com it comes from? Can we vouch for the sender of the information? 
then we can start looking at what the information is. Mm. So much information today that it's just out there floating around, then it's really hard to start diving into if it's correct or not. Mm. Okay, good. this is a really good spot, I think, to springboard and to think about the manifesto and to think about this question, what should be done?